a very big project for, for our country. Costing 900 million pounds, the dam will feed a massive hydroelectric system, supplying power to industry. Building it is a mammoth challenge. If this isn't finished, we can't start filling the lake. But the dam is just part of the project. Before they can generate power, workers must blast a giant turbine hall out of solid rock and dig a tunnel 40 kilometers long. For four years, the construction team will toil in the harsh Icelandic wilderness to get this high-voltage megastructure powered up and producing electricity. They'll face equipment failure. What that mean? Rock falls and flooding. Measurable working conditions. In a battle against time to build the Icelandic Super Dam. Iceland, August 2006. For over three years, work has been underway on the country's biggest ever engineering project, the Karanuka Dam. The goal of this massive venture is to harness the power of one of Iceland's most abundant resources, water, and turn it into cheap electricity. Basically, this project is very sound for our economy. We have very few resources in this country. We cannot only live on fish exports. One of the main resources we have is water power and the geothermal power. And so we are harnessing both. A hydroelectric project like this requires the building of not one, but three enormous structures. A dam, 13 times the size of Wembley Stadium, to harness and collect water from two raging glacial rivers. A massive piping system, almost as long as the Channel Tunnel, to deliver a high-pressure torrent of water from the dam to the final stage of the project, the powerhouse, a hydroelectric generator plant, housed in a cavern blasted from solid rock a kilometer inside a mountain. The challenges are enormous. It's a battle with nature, of course. Underground, it's a battle with rock and the inflow of groundwater. Uh, on the surface, it's a battle with the elements. This is a critical stage of the build. In just five weeks, the dam must be ready to collect water, and a major section of the tunnel has to be completed. But this isolated and harsh environment will present the international team of engineers and builders with setback after setback. Everybody knows that a dam blocks rivers. But to provide a dry working area while the dam is being built, the rivers must be diverted around the construction site. When you build dams across a river course, the river has to be someplace during that construction period. Diverting the two rivers here took nine months alone. These rivers are central to the project, providing the water that will form a reservoir behind the dam, the water which will eventually power the turbines. And they're born here, at Vatna Yucatl, the largest glacier in Europe. Its ice cap covers over 7,700 square kilometers and contains around 3,400 trillion liters of frozen water. That's enough to cover the Isle of Wight with a block of ice 112 kilometers high. In summer, the glacier melts, creating a raging river system. But even with this powerful summer meltwater, the reservoir that will be created behind the dam is so large that it'll take a year to fill. That's why the dam must be finished by September 2006. It's the only way they'll have enough time to fill the reservoir by autumn 2007, when power production must start. Filling of a reservoir is always important in, uh, in, uh, in a project like this. There is a big pressure to finish and start production and produce money. If they miss the September deadline, not enough water will be in the reservoir next year to drive the generators and produce electricity. So time is tight. This type of dam is made by placing millions of tons of rubble into a gorge then coating the outside of the rubble pile with concrete to make it watertight. And the best way to get the rubble is by blasting. There's two main quarries on the site. Um, probably 80% of the dam materials come from this quarry. On an average day, huge dump trucks drop 55 tonnes of rock and earth every two minutes. 
To improve waterproofing, rock is deposited in layers, from coarse to fine. We're up to about 98% completion on the filling. So what you can see here, this last section of the dam here will be finished in the next month or month or month and a half. Building a dam on this scale is an incredible feat of engineering. The pressure from 2,100 billion litres of water on the dam wall is huge. And it's this concrete covering that'll take the brunt of the force. To provide a strong foundation for the concrete covering, the workers first attach steel reinforcement, called rebar. The steep and slippery wall is exposed to strong winds blowing off the glacier. Working conditions are tough. One slip could end in a very long fall. It's a very steep slope. The dam is about 200 meters high. So you always have to be careful in a, on a construction site like this, yes. The next stage is to cover the rebar in concrete. But there's a problem. At the on-site concrete factory, engineers have discovered there's too much air in the concrete mix. Get the mix wrong, and the concrete could crack, potentially disastrous in a dam. The quality of the concrete has to be very good, otherwise you will have leakage through the dam, and, and, and you, you know, you, it, could be, it could be a disaster. Has this been all night? For chief engineer Richard Graham, the hold-up is very bad news. And what are we doing to change it? What, is, what are the plant people doing? Sorry? I don't know. Delays like this are a constant challenge on such a huge project, but they need to find a solution fast. Can we put a new one? Can we go find a different batch, a new batch, completely new batch? Hmm? We can't continue like this. We have all this concrete to throw away. Dam construction is stalled until the concrete problem is solved. And there are only five weeks left until the dam must be ready to collect water. The Karanuka Dam project in Iceland. Autumn 2006. There's now only one month left to complete the dam in time to allow the glacial meltwater to form a reservoir. To fill the reservoir, it takes more than a year, so it, 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 it's that big. If they miss their September deadline, the project will be massively delayed. We could lose one season and that could then mean a delay in the production and delivery of power for up to one year. But nothing on this project is easy. Today's problem, a bad batch of concrete. Too much air in the concrete mix means it can't be used, and work on the dam face is halted. Workers battle to resolve the problem. And eventually, they succeed. All the concrete which is produced is tested. We had some values which were slightly higher than the ones planned in the design. So we had to readjust the dosage system and just put it back to, to what it should have been. Every day or at least every week there are some, some difficulties that are arising and uh, it's, it's a very tough thing to, to build a hydroelectric plant. Technically and construction wise it is complicated uh, that because there are so many different elements. A new batch of concrete is rushed into production and the workers can resume coating the dam face. The dam requires 450,000 tons of concrete to cover its face. And that massive amount has to be laid as a single, perfectly smooth layer. Any imperfections and the dam could leak. But how do you lay concrete on a surface sloped like a mountain? There's only one machine able to perform this gravity-defying stunt, and it's called a slip form. The slip form is a structure which needs to be custom made on every single dam of this type because you need to take into account the slope in which you're, you're going to concrete the face slab. You need to take into account the width of the slave slab plus also the length of the pores that you're going to perform. It's pulled up the slope or face slab by two winches whilst being fed with truckloads of wet concrete. This slip form basically gives the, the constant thickness 
to be placed and also uh, the finishing of the face lab itself. Workers standing on a platform inside the slip form smooth out any imperfections on the face. But once in motion, this giant machine can't stop. If it did, the face slab wouldn't be flawless and there would be a danger of cracks. So the machine works night and day, covering a strip 60 meters long in one continual pour. With the slip form back up and running, the project's in full flow. The workers are happy. But not everyone in Iceland feels the same way. During the build, there's been some opposition to the dam from Icelanders. The project has left a massive footprint. 57 square kilometers of Iceland's pristine highlands lost underwater. The impact on wildlife is a concern. The reservoir site covers the breeding grounds of birds and reindeer. I have all along kept in mind why are we building this big project in the first place? For who is that good? And is it right to do it? And my conclusion has always been yes, it is. The majority of the power created by the project is for a new aluminium smelting plant. But any surplus energy can be fed into the national grid. It is built for economical reasons. Electrical energy is getting, as everybody knows, more and more valuable in the world. Uh, in Iceland, we produce what is regarded as clean energy. The rivers continue to flow, but we needed to make some compromises, of course, with the people. Opinion is still divided. But despite the politics, this project is mind-boggling as an example of man's power to harness natural resources and utilizes the one resource Iceland has in abundance, water. This is how it works. Water from two rivers is collected into a reservoir behind the dam. This water then travels along a huge pipe called the Head Race Tunnel to the top of a mountain where it's dropped 137 stories straight down. Flowing at 144,000 litres a second, this water then has enough power to drive six massive turbines, which generate huge amounts of electricity. To get the maximum power from the system, the reservoir must be as high as possible, and the powerhouse, where the turbines are, should be as low as possible. The idea is to bring water from a higher place to a lower place, and the different the difference between elevations or heights is pressure, and it is the pressure that turns the turbines. But to get from the high point to the low point, in our case, is quite a sizable distance. Uh, 40 kilometers is the main tunnel. Even for most projects uh, I've heard of, this is uh, really on the high side. Constructing the 40 kilometer tunnel required to get the water from the dam to the powerhouse is one of the biggest challenges on this project. Diverting huge amounts of water this far underground has never been attempted before in Iceland. It's an enormous challenge, in the toughest terrain. Even if we have excellent geologists, they can never predict fully how things look at uh, 200 meters depth. Uh, it, it is unavoidable that there are always some surprises. And to tunnel underground through the complex Icelandic geology, you need something rather special. This is a TBM, or tunnel boring machine. Weighing in at a monstrous 600 tons and measuring over 120 meters from tip to tail, this massive machine is designed for one thing only, eating rock. At the front, the cutter head is seven and a half meters in diameter, covered in hardened steel cutters. This is the business end of the beast and where the tunnel borer attacks the rock face. Sitting behind the cutter head is the drive train. It gives the TBM the stability and power needed to crush solid rock to dust. Hydraulic legs and side grippers work together to stop the machine from spinning on its axis. Four massive pistons provide the force to thrust the cutter head into the rock face. The crushed rock is then transported down the inside of the machine on a conveyor belt to keep the tunnel clear. Inside the TBM, it's cramped. There are workshops, storage areas, power and water supplies. 
everything needed to support the lives of the 30 contractors who work there. It's an awesome machine, and the Karanuka Dam project needs three of them. To cut construction time, the three TBMs work on different parts of the tunnel simultaneously, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The first TBM cuts south. The second and third machines go east-west. And all of them are aiming to meet each other at predetermined locations in the tunnel. This is harder than it sounds, because underground there's no normal way of knowing which direction the machines are going. This far down, all reference to direction is lost. GPS or global positioning systems don't work. If they go off course, there'll be three separate tunnels going nowhere. The tunnels have to meet, of course, to get the, the, the water through. The job of making sure the TBMs go exactly where they're supposed to is down to the surveyors. Starting from a single known point, they use lasers to establish the exact location of the TBMs as they progress. The data is analyzed back at main camp to check if the TBMs are steering true, both horizontally and vertically. Using this information and a full array of computers and TV monitors on board, the drivers are able to steer the machines with incredible accuracy. The surveyors have tracked the TBM's path twice a day, every day, for over two years. Soon they'll find out if their calculations are correct. The tunnel borers are racing against the clock. The hydroelectric system has to be producing power by the autumn of 2007. To stay on schedule, the first TBM has to break through into the tunnel already bored by the second TBM by September 2006. If all goes according to plan, this meeting will take place here, halfway along the head race tunnel, in less than one month's time. The challenges are always the same, uh, that is to do the work in time. Uh, well, my job is to push everybody, the, the designer, the contractors and, and the supervision and on a huge project like this, you know, the time schedule is of essence. This is tunneling on a time limit. If they can hit their deadlines, the water delivered by the tunnel will eventually arrive here, the powerhouse. This is where water will be turned into electricity. It's taken three years to carve this gigantic cavern out of solid rock. 340,000 cubic meters of rock have been cleared from inside the mountain. And the best way to clear a space this big is blasting. Okay. Go. Blasting is used for any excavations that are either too big or too small for the tunnel boring machine. But blasting above ground is dangerous enough 180 meters underground, each detonation is a calculated gamble. This is a dangerous job. You have to have the right equipment and the right people, experienced people, that's always the same. There's a set pattern to this work. The area is cleared. The charge master primes his explosives and everyone in the vicinity blocks their ears, closes their eyes and braces for the blast. The shock wave surges up and down the confined space. The smoke clears and success. A giant pile of rubble is all that's left of over 530 tons of wall. The weight of over three jumbo jets. That's a lot of rock. And it all has to be cleared. First, it's fed into a machine that crunches it into smaller pieces. This material is then fine enough to fit onto an industrial-sized conveyor belt, which is around 40 kilometers long. It's one of the most vital machines employed on this project. Without it, the tunnel would quickly become blocked. It's situated next to a subterranean railway, which carries a small army of men up and down the tunnels. Our trains here are the only railway system that, that there is in Iceland. About uh, 60 kilometers of rails to be able to reach all the excavation points inside the tunnel. Sometimes we had rides of 50 minutes, you can take a nap or a small rest. 
High above the powerhouse, workers are constructing the pressure shafts. These are giant 420 meter vertical pipes that the water will plunge down before arriving at the turbines. But in order to drive the turbines, this water will be under huge pressure and handling that bone crushing force is no easy task. To prevent the high pressure water from bursting out, the pressure shafts are reinforced with massive steel pipe. Each piece is about 40 tons lowered by heavy winch put into place on top of the one below. It takes precise and careful maneuvering to guide a pipe that big into place. Next, workers carefully weld the sections together. It's a really tough job, I would say, you know. It's, it's hot in there and uh, this is not a job for anyone. Water will enter the powerhouse at 144,000 liters per second. A system failure anywhere in the pressure shaft would flood the powerhouse in seconds. It would be a disaster for the powerhouse. The powerhouse would definitely be flooded and that would be a big economic disaster. But that, that isn't going to happen. <laughs> All the pipes in this system have to be immensely strong to cope with the high pressure water they carry. It's the most unforgiving of adversaries. But the structure which has the toughest job with water is the dam. Stopping 2,100 billion liters of water from flowing away down the valley demands incredible planning and a highly skilled and conscientious workforce. The dam itself uh, has to hold uh, a huge amount of water and huge pressures. It's normal for dams to shift and settle over time due to the huge weight of the rock they're made from and the immense water pressure of the reservoir. If it settles properly, a dam will be strong. If it doesn't, the constant pressure of the water will force it to give way. To ensure that the Karanuka Dam isn't moving too much or in the wrong way, surveyors mark positions on the face and then plot them against fixed coordinates. Okay, Carlo, up 10 centimeters. Go up, up, go up. They can then measure in what direction and by how far the wall is moving. It continues to settle over time and it is important to keep this within certain limits. It's vital to monitor the, the behavior of the dam during the construction period. Like a hole in a dike, even a small weak spot could bring the dam down. And for a structure this big, it would be a disaster on an unimaginable scale. In 2006, Brazil's Campos Novos Dam, the third tallest of its kind in the world, suffered a major failure. Billions of gallons drained from the reservoir, causing a massive disaster. So in Iceland, the surveyors monitor construction at every stage, checking for movement. At 200 meters high, the dam is the tallest of its kind in Europe, and the engineers want to make sure it stays that way. Iceland, 2006. Workers are rushing to complete a massive tunnel. It'll link the Karanuka Dam to an electricity generating powerhouse 40 kilometers away. There are three tunnel boring machines, or TBMs, working their way towards each other, but they don't have long. To stay on schedule for piping water to the powerhouse by the autumn of 2007, this section of tunnel has to meet the next section in just three weeks. The challenges are, are always the same, that is to, 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 to do the work in time. Each tunnel will pass through a variety of different rock types, and this has a huge impact on the progress of the TBMs. We are virtually crossing the, the whole uh, history of Icelandic geology on the way. And the oldest rock was something like 7 million years old, and the youngest was only 200,000 years old. It's a kind of like a, like a cake or a tart, where you are always drilling th through the next layer. Chief geologist Peter Pitts keeps a close eye on things. Even a slight change in conditions can lead to problems. If the rock's too soft, it blocks the TBM's cut ahead. You can see it here. We have to use some water to help the cut ahead, to turn the cooling, etc. And the water and these sediments together will clog the cut ahead. 
He also watches out for structural weaknesses in the tunnel. Hit one, and they could have a cave-in on their hands. Then there's the issue that has plagued this project from day one, water. This whole hydroelectric system depends on harnessing the power of water, but it constantly finds a way to slow the tunnel boring machines. Large quantities of water coming into the tunnel. Very cold, two, three degrees, measurable working conditions, and the water's becoming too much in cases to actually be able to easily advance the TBM. Water is very difficult to handle. In most cases in tunneling, water is the biggest enemy of the, of the tunneling people. It's a challenge, it's difficult to deal with water. In order to break through in three weeks, the team has to make sure nothing else slows the tunnel boring machines down. Easier said than done. Over at the powerhouse, workers have reached a critical moment in construction. Lowering part of one of the generators called the stator into position. This giant steel ring is six meters in diameter, filled with tightly wound wire and weighs over 130 tons. It needs to be treated with great care. It could easily crush delicate wiring or, even worse, technicians working below. Just if we manage to lower it slowly, slowly. This generator is a piece of precision engineering. It has to fit together perfectly for maximum efficiency. Water flows from the reservoir into the head race tunnel and then plunges 420 meters down the vertical pressure shafts. It comes into the bottom of the generator under incredible pressure. When the water hits the turbine that sits at the base of the generator, it causes it to spin. This, in turn, rotates a shaft, which sits on top of the turbine. On top of the shaft are magnets, and when they spin inside a mass of wiring, it generates electricity. OK, all. Push down a little bit. Oh, stop. The planned output of the powerhouse is an astonishing 690 megawatts. That much electricity would power half a million homes. But only if they can get the water to the powerhouse. And that's looking doubtful. One of the TBMs has ground to a halt. It looks like an electrical fault. The thing is that you always have to, to react to something that happens, and that's what we are, we are here for. Finally, they find the problem. A loose wire shorting out the machine. After emergency repairs, work on the tunnel linking the dam and the powerhouse is restarted. With just two weeks left, Teams in the tunnel and at the dam race to meet their deadlines before the winter freeze sets in. And they're busy at the powerhouse as well, with an exciting new arrival. This is a transformer. It takes the electricity coming out of the generator and increases its voltage before sending it off to the power grid. High voltage electricity is easier to transmit over long distances than low voltage electricity. And hydropower is all about maximizing energy output. So the transformers are key to the success of the project. This transformer and five others have to be hauled a kilometer down into the mountain. At 116 tons, that's no easy feat. Sitting four and a half meters high, it's very top heavy. Lean one way too far and the transformer could topple over. The team move it very carefully. But once inside the power plant, they face another challenge. Without room for a crane, these workers have to lift this huge component by hand. To lower the transformer, they use an old-fashioned technique called jacking down. It's a slow process, but there's no other way. 
It's very difficult to handle transformers which weigh more than 100 tons inside a cabin. So it has to be done very carefully and slowly and one step at a time. This piece of machinery is an integral link in the power supply chain and has to be treated with care. But the chief electrical engineer is not entirely happy. The, the rate is supposed to be higher. Yeah, yeah. It's out of alignment by a few centimeters. It may be a huge project, but the tolerances are tiny. The transformer has to fit like a glove. After this one, there are five more transformers to be installed. So the last thing the engineers need is another problem in the tunnel. Tunnel boring has had to stop because the conveyor belt system is not clearing the tunnel fast enough. After literally moving a mountain of rock, the belts are wearing thin and the conveyor system is constantly breaking down. And when the conveyor comes to a stop, so does the tunnel boring. Of course, at the end of uh, 15 or 20 kilometers of boring, even the belt conveyors get worn out. It's one more difficulty to overcome, and it couldn't have happened at a worse time. They don't have long until the TBM has to break through and connect the vast sections of tunnel together. Flaviano Sulizin, the man responsible for getting the tunnel borer to reach its target, is stressed. Well, a project like this is stressful, obviously, because uh, you're always challenging time, challenging uh, difficulties. The delay caused by the broken conveyor belt is bad news. Soon, all eyes will be on this wall. They must keep the conveyor belt system working. Broken belts arrive by the truckload. To keep on schedule, Conveyor belt personnel work overtime, repairing hundreds of shredded belts. Each one takes at least eight hours to fix. The men work through the night to get the conveyor belt moving, so the tunnel borer can break through on time. It would have been better if it hadn't happened, but uh, that's our job, to be able to, to plan forward, to have many plan Bs, but Cs and Ds for any possible event that may occur. While work is moving slowly on the tunnel, at the dam wall, the mobile concrete pouring platform, called the slip form, is on the verge of victory, finishing the concrete facing on the dam. This pour started nearly 24 hours ago. After months of back-breaking work, covering over 93,000 square meters with concrete, they're only hours from finishing this last long haul. Rendering this giant wall as waterproof as possible and strong enough to hold back the reservoir. All that remains after this mammoth effort is to fix a waterproof membrane to the outside of the concrete. The dam is on track, but then more bad news from down in the tunnel. There's been a rockfall and one of the TBMs has ground to a halt. What we've got to do is contain it now. Last night, uh, while we were boring slowly, this collapsed, this rock here. These pieces of rock are still not stable and we cannot proceed. The tunnel borers occasionally come across fissures or faults in the rock face. Instead of being ground to dust, huge rocks come crashing down. So not only is the machine unable to make progress, but the men working below are in constant danger. We now have to make this safe. After battling electrical issues and a worn-out conveyor, the tunnel borers are facing their worst setback yet. All the effort to finish the dam and powerhouse on time will be for nothing if the TBMs fail to finish the tunnel. This is a serious problem. With this problem now and this reduction, this dramatic reduction of the driving rate, this tunnel has now become the most critical drive of the whole project. With the crumbling rock too loose for the borer to get a grip, the crew have to dig their way out of trouble. It's slow, painstaking, and labor intensive. Because the boulders are too big to fit on the conveyor belt, each rock has to be manhandled onto a flatbed and taken by train to the surface. 
So it's a bit ironic that a machine that's costing millions of dollars, high tech, high sophistication, is reduced to uh, people doing handwork, moving stones one by one. Well, it's, it's a tough job, it's time consuming, and, uh, but the, the willingness to go ahead uh, makes you overcome also these problems. You need tough people to, to be able to work in conditions like here. It's an unthinkable delay at a crucial time. At the Dern, however, workers are on the home straight. The last stage of this part of the project involves attaching a PVC membrane to the lower part of the dam. Its purpose is to act as an extra protective layer to reduce the chances of leaks. Chief Engineer Richard Graham must get the membrane installed before the dam can start collecting water. This is very critical. You realize that if, if this isn't finished, the dam, we can't start filling the lake. So we're really on the, the real critical part of this project. Once the membrane's in place, the workers still have to cover it in soil as an extra layer of protection. So there's still a vast amount to do. September the 9th, 2006. After a serious delay, tunnel boring is now back on track. But to stay on target for power production in the autumn of 2007, they must break through this rock face today. But this will only happen if the TBM has been exactly on course for the last two years. This is the time they find out whether all their hard work will pay off. The tunnel borer has chewed its way to just shy of the target. All going well, breakthrough will happen in the next two hours. 718 days after starting this enormous challenge, the end is in sight. The tunnel borer has cut through 14 kilometers of hard rock. It's the moment of truth. If all the numbers are right, the tunnel borer is now only two and a half meters from breakthrough. It's been a huge group effort to get this far. Geologists, surveyors, engineers, and workers toiling away at the rock face. And it all comes down to a big red circle painted on a wall. In a tunnel, you always have surprises. You're never confident before you make the breakthrough. There's no room for error. It's unlikely, but if the machine misses its mark, the entire project will be delayed. But then, another problem. For some reason, the tunnel borer has stopped again. And no one this side of the rock face knows why. On board the TBM, Flaviano Solazin searches desperately for answers. What happened? Go ahead, go ahead. Start the engine. They must get the TBM started up and digging, or this vital deadline could be missed. The Karanuka Dam. September 2006. Deep underground, crews are about to discover if a critical milestone will be reached or not. The tunnel boring machine has to break through this wall today. But it's stopped dead, and no one knows why. The chief engineer wants answers fast. Flaviano Solizin, the man responsible for the smooth running of this operation, is feeling the strain. But eventually, they work out the problem. According to the computer, the tunnel borer should have already broken through. It's alerted the driver with a warning to shut off the power and stop the huge machine. Relieved that the problem is for once a simple one, Chief Engineer Solazin orders the driver to fire up the TBM and push on through. Finally, the huge machine roars into life again. Back on the breakthrough side, people move back from the impact zone. It's clear that the tunnel borer is getting closer. The floors and walls of the cavern are shaking. Finally, cracks appear. 
Rocks start to fall and eventually the massive cutter head breaks through the last few centimeters of rock face. The cutter head and the target circle match up precisely. It's an interesting feeling. You hear the machine and, and you know it's coming and, and, and when, you, when the first rock falls off the face, you feel very good, you know. After two years of constant drilling, overcoming mechanical failures, rock falls and water bursts, crushing and removing over one and a half million tons of rock, the team has finished a critical stage of the project. The tunnels are connected and the hydroelectric system is one step nearer to producing power. It's a, quite an achievement being on this job for five years and seeing the end, the light in the tunnel, as you say. <laughs> it's very satisfying. The TBM crew crowd behind the cutter head. This is the day everyone's been waiting for. It marks a huge milestone. The surveyors and the crew have every reason to celebrate. They've steered the tunnel borer over 14 kilometers on a near perfectly straight line and hit their target within centimeters. Every breakthrough is emotional. Uh, you, you, you are achieving one of the targets that you have set uh, maybe years before. Perfect. We start perfect, we finish perfect. The crew was very good. Really, it was a nightmare for us. For me, also. But we are here. Celebrations are in order, but there isn't much time to rest. The construction team still has a vast amount of work to do. There's the tunnel to clear of debris, and the boring machine to be dismantled, along with kilometers of conveyor belt, railway line, power cables and air ducting. And the other two tunnel borers still have to fully complete their sections of the tunnel. Work will go on around the clock for another year. June. 2008. The reservoir has formed. The enormous effort from the dam construction team paid off and they made their September deadline for catching the glacial meltwater in time. It's a satisfaction for all of us uh, working for, for years and years and for the workforce, for, for everybody. Uh, it's a challenge which has been won and achieved. And after several setbacks, the tunnel was completed just six months behind schedule. Despite this delay, the powerhouse was up and running less than two months late, in November 2007. When I stood in the power station and all six turbines were running full blast, uh, that was for me almost sentimental to stand there and, and experience that, I must admit that. This shaft is rotating at 600 revs per minute, driven by the enormous water pressure made possible by the reservoir 40 kilometers away. In the control room, the monitors show the incredible power being generated. Right now, it's nearly 500 megawatts. This is routed through the transformers, now finally perfectly installed, to the power lines and away up the valley. And after doing its work, the water flows peacefully away. This is an astonishing engineering achievement. It's quite an accomplishment, uh, what has been done here. In short, proud and, 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 and happy. If you love your, your, your job, your work, uh, you do feel proud. They've battled through the toughest of conditions, with Mother Nature setting the tightest of deadlines. But against all the odds, the designers and builders of the Icelandic Superdam, the tallest dam of its kind in Europe, have created a source of power that will last for decades. It was a wonder pill that changed men's lives everywhere. Tonight we examine the impact that little blue pill has had on sex in the UK. We hear from the experts and from some users. Viagra, 10 years on the rise, in an hour, here on 5.